Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video in our Autodesk Structural Bridge Design in which we are going to continue our two-span pre-stressed beam bridge design series. Now if you are new to this channel, this video is part of a bigger series in which we are going to cover everything related to the analysis and design of pre-stressed bridges. However, we are starting with a simplified version of that problem as a precursor to the bigger problem. In today's video, we are going to understand how to draw something called an influence surface, understand what it means, and apply some traffic loads on the influence surface to produce the maximum moments and the maximum shears. So as you can see, it is a very important video to watch. And with that being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you are new to this video and you're kind of overwhelmed, like how did we even get here, please take a look on the video series I will be linking on the top right. Now to do our influence surface, we should go to data and select influence surface. But wait, you might have a model where the influence surface is not there. Now first of all, make sure you have Autodesk Structural Bridge Design 2025 and also you could download the latest bridge file which is Bridge Project 6. Uh, from the video description of the previous video, which I'll be linking again on the top right. If you don't see influence surface still, then make sure that you have a refined model selected. Because if you select a line beam, then you don't see the, the task here. So I will go and select my refined model, go to data and select influence surfaces. Now, what is an influence surface? An influence surface is a generalization of an influence line. What is an influence line? Now, I know that you have studied this in structures, but let me give you a quick reminder. If you have a certain beam, let's say you have a simply supported beam with a roller here and a pin here. Okay, there is a major difference between the bending moment diagram and the influence line. So what does the bending moment diagram answer? What is the question that the bending moment diagram answers? The question that the bending moment diagram answers is, what is the bending moment at any point on the beam if the load is positioned at a certain point. This is what a bending moment diagram does. Basically, if you have a load, then of course we all know that the bending moment diagram for this thing looks like this. Of course, I'm drawing positive downwards, so I'm using the design bending moment diagram. You could draw positive upwards, not my point here. So what is the bending moment diagram? The bending moment diagram is the answer to the following question. What is the bending moment value at any point X for a fixed load? So the load is not moving, but the point X is moving. Let me explain this differently here. Let's say you take the bending mode diagram value here, and let's say the value is five. This value five means that the bending moment value at this point for a given load is five. Let's take another value, let's say this one, and this value is seven. This means that the bending moment value at a point here, when the force is given, is seven. Notice that the point is moving, and the load is not. That's why the bending moment diagram answers the question, what is the bending moment at any point on the beam if the load is at a certain position? Now, what is the influence line? I like to call it the inverse of a bending moment. Allow me to explain. And you have, for example, once again, a simply supported beam, and you want to know the influence line for the moment at this point. What you do is, of course, here I'm saying Müller-Breslau, it's a long story, you should learn this from structural analysis books, but according to Müller-Breslau's method of drawing an influence line, you would have to apply two moments like this and bend the beam like this. Of course, I'm going to use the design uh, moments, so I'm going to bend it like this. Okay. Now they look similar, it seems, because it's a simply supported beam, but there is a major difference here. The major difference is, first of all, we drew the influence line without knowing the force. We don't know what the force value is. The only thing we know is the force position, okay? That's the first thing. Influence line is using a unit force to be drawn. Now, what does the influence line mean? To understand what an influence line means, I want to explain what the influence line answers. What is the bending moment at a specific point when the load is positioned at another point or at any point? You see how things changed. For the bending mode diagram, the point was any point, meaning the point was moving, and the load was specific, it wasn't moving. This is vice versa. If I say that this is the influence line of the moment at this point, let's read what the influence line tells us. If I read here and see, for example, here a point 2 as a result, what does this point 2 here mean? It means that 
if the force is placed here, the moment on my target point is 0.2. It takes some time to uh, get used to it, but that's how it's read. Let's take another point. Let's say that I want to measure what this point means. And let's say this point is 0.5 of value. This is an influence line, ladies and gentlemen. For the 0.5 meaning here, it means that if you place the force here, then the moment on your target point is 0.5. Look at the difference. I will remind you of both readings. So this value and this value. I will compare how we read it. This value means that for a given force with a certain position that doesn't change, the moment on a point here is 7. However, for this point, how will I read it? This point reads as follows. For a specific point that never moves, when the force is positioned here, the value of the moment at that specific point is 0.5. I hope this makes sense. Now, if it still doesn't make sense, you might need to brush up your uh, structure analysis skills. So check out a book by R.C. Hibbler. It might be interesting. And this is an influence line for the moment, of course. What is an influence surface? The influence surface is an extension of the influence line. When you study the influence line, you usually learn that you have a certain beam, standalone, disconnected from the entire world, and the load is moving on it. However, that's seldom the case. A beam is usually part of a big structure. Let's say we have one beam here and one beam here, just for simplicity's sake. And of course, those beams are connected by a slab, so there is a slab here between them. And of course, let's put some supports here. Everything is pinned. So this is pinned, that's pinned, that's pinned, and that one is pinned, but you cannot see the pin. Okay, let me show you how an influence surface is drawn. Let's target this point and say that you want to have the influence surface of the moment at that point. You would have to take a point load with a value of 1 and move it everywhere on the entire surface. And on every place on the surface, you will have to get the moment value here and plot it. So it would look something like this. The further the load is away, the less uh, effect on the moment it has. And almost zero here. Let me just try. I'm not really good at drawing 3D. I'm just going to try to draw this. Of course, this is just a quick drawing. You need to, of course, solve it step by step. I might make an Autodesk robot video where I explain to you how those things mean and how you could actually verify them by hand. This is an influence surface. What does it say? Well, let's take a look on this point, for example, here. This point. This point might have a value of 0.2 or something. What does this point mean? This point means that if the one force is here, the moment on this point is 0.2. I hope it makes sense. Now, why do you need an influence surface? You need an influence surface because you want to know where to put your car, and where to put your pedestrians, and where to load your loads, the live loads especially. You need to place the loads in such a way that makes it as bad as possible on the beam, i.e. it increases the moments and shears to the max. That is the topic of today. I had to do this little theoretical dive here because influence line seems to be one of those topics that People tend to have problems with it, and this is influence surface, so it's an extension of what an influence line is. Anyway, I hope it made sense. Now back to our point here. Let's go to the Autodesk Structural Bridge Design. And remember, we have selected in our active model the refined model, and now we're going to go to data, influence surface. Okay, now let's apply the knowledge we have. We want to pick something. It asks you to pick a beam element. You could pick a beam element, element by element. I mean, you need to pick one, two, three, four, or something. But it's kind of annoying. I want to pick a full beam fully. Instead of picking an element, one, two, three, four, and so on, I want to pick the entire beam. So instead of beam element, I will go and ask it for longitudinal beams. Now, if I click, it will select the entire beam. How do I know the entire beam is selected? You can see that it is like piece by piece. And you can see each piece, like look, if you click here, you can see this is piece number one, and that's its starting point, and so on. So each piece of those pieces is one of the 13 pieces that constitute the beam here. Using those pieces, I'm going to find the influence line of bending moments. So how do I do that? It's actually very simple. Just click Analyze. So all I had to do 
is to select a longitudinal beam. Of course, I'm selecting this beam only. You need to select everyone, but of course, I'm only focusing on one beam now. And you can just regenerate. Now, Autodesk Structural Bridge Design actually asks you to select reciprocal here. Reciprocal means that he will apply the load on each point on its own. It's kind of faster, so I will select it. If you click Analyze, it will take some time, depending on your computer. And it creates the influence surface. And it looks beautiful. What is this? Remember, uh, what you see here is the influence surface of the moment on a certain point, which is point 37 here. If you click 38, it changes. Click 39, it changes. 40, it changes. Now, what does it mean? This means that if you apply a force, and notice, if you apply a force directly on the point, you get the maximum positive moment. There are places where you get negative moment, but that's, I think, something good. For example, here, you have a negative value here. What does it mean? It means that if you apply a force here, for example, the moment on your target point is going to be negative a small amount. Of course, the moment is maximum positive below the exact point, because if you apply a force on that point, you get the maximum moments. So that's the influence surface of the beam. If you look on top, you will see a nice contour map, which even makes more sense, because now you have created your influence lines. It's time to apply loads. Where would you apply the loads? I have a theory, a very simple theory here. Now, of course, I'm selecting 45 here, joint member, which is this one. And let's say I want to apply the loads in such a way that it maximizes the positive moments. How would I do that? Well, I would load the entire surface. If you have a distributed load, I would load the entire surface, only the surface that adds to the positive. I would not even touch this. If you have a car, I would place the car exactly here. Because if I place the car somewhere else, I will get the maximum moments. Now, this is a nightmare to do by hand, and that's why this software exists. This software automates this entire process. How do you automate that? By optimizing the position of the load. It applies the load in certain ways to optimize meaning. Now, the word optimization usually means minimization, but in this case, it means optimizing the position of the load which means getting the most out of your load, which means placing the load in strategic locations that maximizes the effects on the structure. So we need to optimize our load. I just select here, run optimization. But before you select that, you need to click on type. And I want to optimize for road and traffic because my bridge is a road bridge. Select road and traffic, click run optimization, and now it will open for you the way and what you want to do. Now, first of all, I will clear all because I don't want anything of those. And this seems to be overwhelming at first, but it's not dangerous. For the scope of my analysis, I want it to be both sides, meaning matching and inverse. I want to select the vehicle SV80, but I'm unable to select the vehicle SV80. And as a matter of fact, I'm unable to do anything. But why? It's because I have selected nothing here. Now, I want to select the cases I want to test. So I'm going to go to ULS STR GUB, and for the load cases, I will select GR1A and GR5. Notice when I selected GR5, the load special vehicles became available. In the SLS, I will select once again GR1A and GR5. Now I know you might be overwhelmed. Wait a minute. Why did you select STR GUB? And why did you select group 1A and group 5? This answer is rooted in the code itself. If you check out the code, it will tell you what it means exactly. For example, according to the Eurocode 1990 article A1.3.1, uh, this set B is used when we are not including energy technical actions. So just purely structural. And because our assumption here is that we are focusing on the bridge and we are ignoring the soil, I selected GOB as being my uh, structural combination group of interest. What about GR1A and GR5? Now I will show you one of those. Um, if you go to the code and just search for GR18, now this is something you should know if you are a Eurocode enthusiast. I think I might explain the entire Eurocode in this channel. It will be a monumental task spanning years, but I kind of want to make a legacy here. For example, if you just search very quickly on the Eurocode GR1A, it tells you that, hey, you can use the load combination model one if there is no wind action greater than or smaller than so and so. We are ignoring wind, so that's one of the groups I want. Of course, this is a massive simplification. There is way more than this. I mean, the EN1990 spans 120 pages, so you should read it. 
But I just want to tell you that whatever you select here has a routing inside the code. It actually tells you that it's using BS code and so on. Please keep this in mind. I don't want to make this become a Euro code session, but those are rooted in the code. For the vehicle, I will select SV80. I am assuming that SV80 is the vehicle of choice here, and I am going to start running my analysis. How do I run my analysis? Well, compile loading patterns. The software will basically move the loads in such a way to maximize a certain value. In this case, it will maximize the moments. So I will click on compile loading patterns. You might get some warnings, but those warnings are usually telling you that, hey, the value might be more than what the influence line has predicted, which is fine. No problem. It can be more than what the influence line predicted because we're using real loads. Now let's take a look at what we have. Let's see. This is the maximization of the moments. So if you click, for example, this one, footway UDL. Now, let me try to, let me try to explain to you what happens here. And I'm going to use ULS STR Geo Group 1A. We are talking about this point, okay? Or about any point in general. And by the way, we are actually, actually, we're not talking about a point. We are talking about the entire beam, which is crazily hard to do. It's not easy to do. So this entire beam is going to be maximized for moment. For the footway, for example, notice that we have defined our load on the entire bridge, but only part of it is taken. Also, for example, here, only part of it is taken. The interesting part that contributes to the moment. If you select on this one, you can see only part taken. Only part taken and so on. And even the tandem, the tandem here, this, that's the car we moved because it's moving. Notice that the tandem is placed in a way on the carriageway that maximizes the moment. So it's pretty cool. And it goes on and on and on. This has been done for every single element. So now for every single element, you have the position of the tandem and the position of the loading that creates the maximum loads. This would be a nightmare to do by hand. And that's why those softwares exist. Of course, you can see that for GR5, where you have a different case of tandem, uh, you can see all those things. Please check that out with the code. You can even check out those ones with different tandem positions and so on. I mean, look at this. This is like the SV80 tandem with all its glory. It's pretty cool. You should check that out step by step. It's a long story, by the way. And to understand this fully, you need also to read the Eurocode. I've just shown you some precursors where to go, and it's your task to check that out in detail. If you click OK, it will store the bending moment loads in the model. But this is, it's not only the bending moments I'm interested in. I'm also interested in the shear forces. So I'll have to rinse and repeat the same steps again, but this time for shear forces. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, it's actually really easy. I will just click on the bending moment here and select shear forces. It will note that you only changed one element. So it asks you to change everything, which is yes, of course. Oh, I think I missed those two things. Okay, I will do this by hand. You should have selected the first element, by the way, because it seems it only applies everything below it. But there is a problem. Influence line for shear above the support kind of doesn't make sense. If there is a load above the support, the support swallows the entire load. So for that, Autodesk actually tells you in its manuals that, hey, first of all, this point doesn't make sense because you can see that this is a start and it's on the, it's on the support, so it cannot be done for a shear force. It asks you basically to change this to end, which makes way more sense. So you are not starting at the support, you are starting away from the support. And similarly, if you go here in the last element, you can see that 48 was once taken as a start and once taken as the end. This doesn't make sense because it's on the support. So Autodesk actually suggests deleting this, which I will do. Fantastic, so I think we are ready now. I will quote Autodesk here. Autodesk says, it is not possible to use the reciprocal method for shear at nodes that are supported. So that's a quote on quote from Autodesk. Anyway, I will do the same thing now. I will click on the analysis to analyze the shear force, which is more, which is actually interesting because you can see all the shenanigans of switching signs. For example, if you move here, you can see that we are talking about this point and the shear switches signs. You can even see it in 3D glory if you want by clicking the isometric view. But I'm gonna go here. I think it was point one that interested me. I forgot where it is. Like, let's stop here, for example. 
This is very interesting because it tells you exactly where to place the load from the colors. If I want to maximize the positive value, I would have to place my load here on this entire region and on this entire region, all the bluish colors, and I will leave the green colors be. If I want to maximize the negative shear, I would apply the loads on the entire green position and this inside one and ignore the blue ones. Will the software know this? Will the software understand this? And the answer is yes. If I click on after analysis, if I click on optimization, I don't need to change anything here. I have done it already. I just click on compile loading patterns. Oh, it tells you, do you want to overwrite the previous ones? No, I don't want to do that. I've just finished my moment. So no, it compiles the thing. Of course, it might give you some warnings about the, the loads being higher than what the influence line has anticipated, but that's not my point. Point is I want to see what the load looks like. And look, this is amazing. What you see here is the load optimization by applying the loads here and the tandems. And you can see that my prophecy came into fruition. It actually applied the loads on places to maximize the positive shear. Now, I know that most of you are perfectionists, and if you look and say, oh my God, this is incorrect, because look, he's not applying the load here, and he's not applying the load here, he's not applying the load on this yet bluish one, and he's even applying the loads on those values, which is kind of detrimental, it doesn't make sense. Yes, first of all, you are right, you are 100% right. The loads are not perfect, as you can see. Like for example here, he is applying this slight sliver of load, although he shouldn't. But, like, come on, that's the best it can do. If you don't like that, then try doing this manually. Trust me, you would waste two weekends just, being, just trying to do that. Anyway, you can see that the loads are applied on the positions where they make sense. On the entire beam, by the way. So yeah, I think we have done something very interesting today. We have understood what influence surfaces are and how to apply loads. I click OK here, first of all, to save those things, which are now saved. And I will once again close this because influence surface generation has been done. So yeah, fantastic. We are ready now. I should save the project. And we are ready to tackle the next phase of the project, which is basically to perform the analysis. If you want to go ahead, you can try go calculate and analyze the structure because that's the step of the next video. Anyway, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. I hope you enjoyed. And in the end, before I finish, I want, first of all, to apologize. I have been a little bit slow on my video schedule. Reason behind this is I'm overly busy with the end of semester stuff. But well, that will change because the summer vacation is almost here, so I have some more time. And with that being said, I want to give an influence surface sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye bye.